Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute podcast. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. He's been called the most interesting man at the White House. No, it's not President Trump, but Michael Anton, the former communications director of the National Security Council. In this episode, Tim and I and I have a conversation with Michael about his time at the White House, his views on foreign policy, and his thoughts on the state of California, and in particular, the Bay Area, where he grew up. In addition to being a diplomat and a writer, Michael is an expert on French cooking, wine, and as the author of The Suit, A Machiavellian Approach to Men's Style, an expert on bespoke menswear. We think you'll enjoy this. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's podcast, Michael. Uh, Thank you. So earlier this spring, you stepped down from your position as Director of Communications for President Trump's National Security Council. So it must have been an incredibly challenging year. The ups and downs of our relations with North Korea, Russia, our allies, not to mention the frequent personnel changes in the administration's foreign policy team. What's your most memorable experience? And, And if you can also tell us your worst experience. Uh, most memorable, I don't know. I, I, the one that sticks out right now, and maybe just because somebody I was talking on the phone with a couple of minutes ago brought it up, was going to the Bastille Day Parade in Paris and being up there in the reviewing stand right next, you know, fairly, fairly close anyway to both presidents as we watched that parade. That was, that was pretty memorable. It was impressive and fun and an honor to be there, you know, in a, in a sense representing the country. And what about your worst? Gosh, I, you know... It, I didn't have a bad, a bad experience. I had a good time for the most part in that job and enjoyed the work, enjoyed the people, enjoyed uh, the issues. It was all, uh, you know, it was challenging at times, but it, 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 it's fun. I mean, the worst thing about it, I guess, is that it's just tiring. And so after a while, I, don't know, I, I stayed four years. The first time I worked in the White House, and I was a lot younger, and I didn't have as many family obligations and things. Um, the people who can do that for just years at a time without ever getting exhausted I'm, 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 I'm typically impressed with but uh, yeah it, it, it does wear you out yeah I bet so Micah we've got John Bolton at the NSC Mike Pompeo at the State Department General Mattis at the Pentagon and Nikki Haley at the UN so with that cast of characters what would you say are the administration's top foreign policy and national security priorities and goals over the next year uh, well look so a lot of them are on display right now in the sense that the president's talking about them number one not, I'm not, this is not an order of importance but you know I'm just bringing this one up because he's talking about it is he really wants to see NATO reform itself and live up to its purpose or at least the purpose of its supposed reinvention you know I mean NATO was in was designed and, and built to uh, deter the Soviet Union so you could say that it fulfilled its function in 1989 or 1991 at the latest depending on how you want to count and you know maybe at that point it should have gone away as a lot of people said and it didn't the argument was made that having built this alliance of the structure and interoperability uh, capabilities across different militaries, which is hard to do. We shouldn't get rid of it blithely, but try to, you know, try to see if we could come up with some other uses for it. And it has stepped up and done useful things uh, in, in a few instances. Um, but it's also, you know, the, pres- the president's pointed out, it's it's kind of broken. Uh, it's become, uh, um, it's, it's un- there's an underinvestment, a serious amount of underinvestment from a lot of companies in the alliance and their own defense capabilities. There's a, there's a sort of free rider problem inherent in NATO that he's trying to fix. So that's definitely a priority. Uh, the denuclearization of North Korea, if the North Koreans are serious about following through, which remains to be seen, is certainly a priority. Uh, countering Iran's bad influence in the region and all the ways that it fights a proxy war against the United States and against our allies, that's certainly a priority. Um, you know, those, those are probably uh, maybe the, the, the foremost right now. Uh, that doesn't exhaust the list, but... Uh, there's, you know, for this president, more so than most, uh, he doesn't have a shortage of, of challenges, and therefore there's no shortage of priorities. So Rush Limbaugh has called President Trump's uh, foreign policy achievements, quote, jaw-dropping. Uh, president Trump has helped improve relations between North and South Korea, responded with a missile attack on Assad's use of chemical weapons, uh, expelled Russian diplomats, you know, walked away from the nuclear deal with Iran, and uh, recognized Jerusalem as, as a capital of Israel. So the list keeps going on. Now, how would you characterize Trump's approach to foreign policy, and, and is there a, now a Trump doctrine? Uh, I don't know that, you know, with the doctrine, usually there's something that you can sum up in one sentence. 
Uh, so, you know, the Truman Doctrine is containment, or even a word in that case. The Reagan Doctrine was you know, support armed, uh, armed anti-communist insurgencies. Uh, I don't know if we have a Trump Doctrine yet, but it's that simple. But what he's certainly trying to do is reorient American foreign policy along a much more strict calculation of the national interest. He, he, he believes, as I, I think he's right, that American foreign policy just drifted away from what it was supposed to do. And it became you know, the, the original rationale for certain policies, for trade, certain trade policies, diplomatic policies, the promotion of democracy and so on, was that these things in a given context were good for the United States interest. And that became, people started to lose sight of that and argue in favor of certain things because they just thought, well, these things are good in and of themselves. And it doesn't even matter if they're in the American interest. And they couldn't really even make a case anymore why certain things were in America's interest, which is one of the reasons why all the opposition to Trump was so ineffective is people just kind of sputtered at him and called him a heretic without you know, trying to make an argument. Or they would accuse him of having no argument and in a case of kind of projection, I thought, because he did and they didn't. Um, so if, if, if there is a Trump doctrine, it's uh, America first. It's a slogan he used to use and then uh, started to say that he was getting, you know, he was moving past it. But it, it's a reorientation of, of foreign policy to, to get it back closer to national interests rather than to um, uh, I- ideological tenets that may be, in a lot of cases, really no longer serve the national interest. Well, it seems like every day you turn on the television, there's some other foreign policy challenge. So this next question may be a little hard for you to narrow down, but what do you believe will be the biggest foreign policy challenge or the biggest risk to the U.S. that President Trump could face in the next few years? The the, the easiest answer, because you know this is going to be a problem no matter what else happens, is China. So with North Korea, you don't know. They could stay on the path for denuclearization, or they could start firing missiles again, and, you know, it's much harder to predict. We do know that China, would it come what may, China is going to still be trying to assert sovereignty over uh, international waters in the South China Sea. It's still going to practice economic aggression against the United States. It's still going to be working to fracture U.S. alliances in East Asia. It's a, it's a, China's just a big problem for U.S. foreign policy across the board. It has been for decades. So that's the kind of safe, no-brainer answer that I can give to that question, because there's no possible the way I'll be wrong, <laughs> no matter what happens. <laughs> so given um, Trump's foreign policy victories, not to mention the tax cuts and the rollback of hundreds of federal regulations, do you think that it's possible for um, President Trump to ever win back these uh, never-Trumpers on our side? Um, well, it depends on who they are. I mean, some of them he's already has one back, and others just dig in harder and harder. So, you know, in the case of people like Max Boot, or Elliot Cohen or David Frum. I mean, they've made it clear they're they're not listening. They don't they don't want to be won back. And there's nothing Trump could say or do that would cause them to come back over. But I think in a lot of other cases, you know, some people have been won over wholly, and others have just said, "Look, I, I didn't vote for the guy. I still don't like him, but I got to admit he did the right thing on issue X or issue Y." And you know, I'm an, I'm trying to be honest, and so I'm going to praise uh, I'm going to praise success and the right decision where I see it, even if even in a in, even in a candidate and a politician that. Uh, Uh, you know, I I don't ultimately support. So here's a question that might be comparing apples to oranges, or it could be comparing different types of apples, but you were a speechwriter to Condoleezza Rice back when she ran the NSC. So please compare your time in the Bush administration with your experiences in the Trump administration. That's harder to do just because the experience was very different in that I had... uh, I had a much better seat, in a sense, in the Trump administration. I was a lot closer to the center of the action and saw more and was in more meetings and sort of knew what was going on. I was a little more peripheral, more junior in the the Bush administration. Um, I would say that the similarities, um, there were similarities in that, you know, after after a fairly rocky start, you know, we lost a national security advisor after 24 days. That has never happened before. Um, McMaster, after a few months, got the process under control and got it working the way it's supposed to be, and it started to look like the old uh, Bush administration gold standard uh, of how the process goes. Although a lot of people would say the real gold standard was the first Bush administration uh, and um, Brent Scowcroft, the national security advisor that most subsequent national security advisors point to, saying that they, they want to emulate as closely as they can. So there were some similarities uh, in that I think we got we did get uh, we did get the process on track after a while uh, and, and a lot of differences. I mean that it, um, you know that was a, the post 9/11. Oh, another similarity actually I would say is that 
you know, the, post, the, the Bush post 9 11 night NSC had to essentially reinvent or reorient foreign policy to a completely new world paradigm. And we, this, our, the Trump NSC did too, but not in response to events, but it just in response to the election and the wishes of the president and the campaign promises of the president and the pledges that he made. You know, he's coming in there saying that he was going to change things up pretty strongly. And it was, in a sense, our job to implement that. And so it was also similar to the Bush experience in that it was a time of transformation. So you're the mystery author, Publius Decius, of of the now famous, quote, Flight 93 election article for the Claremont Review, which made the case to conservatives on why they should vote for Donald Trump for president. Could you tell our listeners the genesis for writing that piece, and and do you feel vindicated? Way back in... um you know, the fall of 2015, when Trump started running, I at first, I think like a lot of people, did not take it seriously because he had, he had quote unquote, run for president before, only to drop out before a vote was cast. And so I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him. I just thought he was doing that same thing again and he'd be gone before long. And, and by the time the campaign became serious, he wouldn't be around anymore. But he kept at it and he was talking about issues that I really cared about that I was convinced needed to be addressed and hadn't been adequately addressed. And so I uh, wanted to, you know, I proposed writing an article, uh, making a case for Trump over and above the, uh, all the other candidates in the Republican primary. Uh, and in the end, the magazine I was working with did not publish the article, which uh, I had a friend who had done the same thing. He had, he had written for a magazine, uh, a, a sort of, not a case for Trump, but just an explanation, and then wrote another one, a very good one, and they didn't want to publish that. And we just sort of happened to be together one day talking about this with some others, and we decided that, you know, the conservative movement needed to be shaken up. And so we started a blog called the Journal of American Greatness, which was up for about, I don't know, three months, four months, um, and then taken down. And then I kind of thought, okay, that's behind me. I'm never going to do that again. And as time went on, I thought, actually, I've got more to say. <laughs> really, what, what the Flight 93 election w- uh, was, I thought, I didn't think it would get any attention, really. I didn't think anybody would care about it. Because I thought the people who read JAG or the Journal of American Greatness would understand the argument. But they would also say, well, this just restates everything you were saying there. So, you know, why do I care? I already read all this. This is boring. This is a rehash. And instead, it became this kind of mini phenomenon in the conservative world, which I absolutely did not expect. And honestly, had I known in advance it would have become that, I probably wouldn't have, I almost certainly would not have written it or published it because I would have said, this is too risky. You know, I I chose a pseudonym for a reason because I had uh, a different life, a corporate life. um, uh, And I, you know, I'm thought that it would be too controversial and I would might you know get, conceivably get me in trouble. So if I had known, oh, you know, Rush Limbaugh will read it on the air and everybody will be talking about it for a month and, you know, a couple of years later people will still be talking about it. If you told me that in advance, I would have just said, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I should tell you, uh, multiple people have come up to me at the time that was out and asked me, do I know who this fella is? And um, I sort of did, but I I didn't divulge it. (laughs) But everyone was so curious about who it was and probably wanted to offer you a job. Well, Michael, I'm going to take things westward now. You're a native of California from the Bay Area, and as you know, California has attempted to thwart everything that President Trump is doing. You know, they've tried to stop his agenda on everything from immigration and building the, quote, wall to attempting to raise corporate tax rates because people benefited too much from the Trump tax cuts. So where do you see this fight going? Do you think that California will continue to merge? further left, or will common sense at some point prevail in the Golden State? I think it's going to continue to move further left. I, I you know, I, I the only, my only hesitation is the, the old economist dictum that the fallacy of assuming that present trends will continue forever. But it's the, it's the only thing I have witnessed California do in my lifetime is move left. All of the pressures that have moved it to the left that I have witnessed over my lifetime are, are either still in place or have intensified. So I really have no expectation other than that it's going to just keep going the way it's been going. Um, I was just there. I was um, down in Claremont for a week where I went to graduate school. And the thing about California is that the, it, the nice parts of it are really nice and look better than ever. So while I think the state is basically in bad shape, I mean, the one great exception to that, which I can get to in a minute, which I assume is where you're sitting right now, is San Francisco, which looks as worse as I've ever seen it. And, and it's as rich as it's ever been, and yet it looks worse than it was in the, in the grimy early 90s uh, Art Agnos years, which was, I think, the city's previous low point. Um, but the rest of California, Silicon Valley especially, you know, the, 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 the college towns, it looks, it looks great. And so it, it sort of fools people into thinking that the California model works. 
as long as you don't go out of those areas, and as long as you don't look at the balance sheet, um, yeah, it, it, it seems like it, it seems like a wonderful place. Problem is, it's impossible to afford uh, those w- little pockets. So you either need to be a Silicon Valley o- oligarch to live there, or you need to have bought in years ago and be protected by Prop 13 from uh, your property taxes arising to the point where you get kicked out of your own home, or you live in one of the bad parts that don't really function very well, and and that are com- either neglected by Sacramento or just treated as as re- places to squeeze for revenue. So the, to me, the go-to author on that um, topic and trend is Victor Davis Hanson, who talks about you know these once prosperous farming communities across the Central Valley that essentially are almost uh, governed, don't, are not ungoverned at this point and unpoliced and super under-resourced uh, and, and, and heavily regulated. They're, you know, the, the ways in which they could conceivably make money are heavily regulated by Sacramento, uh, by politicians from these urban areas who really have no idea what the challenges of California's more rural agricultural farming communities are. You know, an interesting, um, I, I was going to say fact, well, I'm not sure the fact, but I have read and seen some analysis which seems convincing to me which shows that the reddest places politically red meaning when you look at a political map in america are not red states they're the red counties in the bluest states so you do have some pockets of of, you know extreme i don't mean extreme as in you know crazy or malevolent but but you know intensely felt passionate conservatism in california in the san joaquin valley in the foothills in in the far north um, that are even redder, you know, than the average county in a red state like, I don't know, Georgia. Um, and that's, you know, also true in upstate New York. But it's just that just feeds the polarization. And I think the, the reason why I say the state as a whole will continue to drift left is because the power centers and the money and the influence is all in um, the Bay Area and West Los Angeles uh, and Orange County. Um, which is no longer a Republican bastion anymore. And they simply vastly outnumber and outgun uh, the, those red parts of the state and will just be able to uh, outvote them with an almost veto-proof majority going for the foreseeable future. So you alluded to San Francisco earlier. You wrote another much-talked-about piece in 2015 for the Claremont Review titled San Francisco Values, where you wrote about the evolution of the values and the culture in the Bay Area and, and the rise of Silicon Valley. So fast forward three years later, Later to today, and there's been a lot of attention lately on the San Francisco homeless problem and the contrast between the poverty and the tremendous wealth in the city. What are your thoughts on this? Look, the reason why San Francisco and the Bay Area generally, Berkeley, and a lot of these communities is that they don't um, enforce any you know vagrancy laws or you know any you know basically any quality of life offenses. Is because I think a big reason is they just feel tremendously guilty about their wealth and they think doing so would be some it's just somehow wrong and evil um, to maintain public standards. I, I think to some extent they think they're doing the homeless uh, a favor that it's somehow uh, noble or compassionate to just sort of let them do whatever they want on the streets. And it's a real mistake, as we've seen, that, you know, the best thing that ever happened to um, poor communities in New York City was the election of Rudy Giuliani, who started enforcing standards again, cleaning these places up, getting the crime rates down. All of a sudden, uh, you know, every meaningful quality of life indicator, including in the poorest communities, starts going up because people feel safe. They go out, they invest, they start little businesses, you know, they spend money. Uh, Life returns to these neighborhoods. Um, San Francisco, for a long time, has had this attitude about for instance, the Tenderloin, which is the worst neighborhood in the city and always has been, that it would just be a shame. It would like it would almost like be depriving the city of this wonderful, colorful character if they went in there and enforced any laws, which is why you have open drug use and public urination and all kinds of things much more disgusting than that going on in there. And the city just steadfastly refuses to even consider any kind of maintenance of public standards or enforcement of public standards. Um, now, there's been a reaction to that in the past. Uh, for instance, Art, the mayor, Art Agnos, who I mentioned a little bit while ago, um, lost an election uh, to a police chief, Frank Jordan, over, precisely over quality of life issues in 1993. Um, it didn't last. Um, Jordan was defeated, but he was defeated eventually by Willie Brown, not by, um, um, you know, another Agnos-style liberal. And Willie Brown, you know, was a, was a it's the bete noir of conservatives in the state of California because he was such an effective assembly speaker at blocking anything remotely Republican. But he was actually a pretty good mayor of San Francisco. You didn't have a lot of these problems when Brown was the mayor because he didn't have a problem with 
in, you know, you know, enforcing basic standards. And he was a liberal, but he wasn't kind of nearly as, as ideologically committed to his liberalism as his successors are. So I think people are finally, from what I read, San Franciscans are really getting fed up and angry. Uh, whether that will translate to any kind of political change, I don't know. The new mayor-elect does not seem to be <laughs> uh, uh, the type of uh, politician, given her statements, that is eager to begin enforcing public standards again. But we shall see. I mean, if there were real voter pressure brought up, if, if people really just got absolutely sick of it and made that clear, the, the system would probably respond. Michael, Yahoo News has called you the most interesting man at the White House, so I'm sure you probably have a career as a beer salesman ahead of you. Reading from their story, they call you a renaissance man who's developed a following as an expert on bespoke menswear. They say that you worked in the kitchen of a now-closed fancy French restaurant in Manhattan. They say that you make meals at home with Japanese chef's knives that you sharpen by hand. And they say that you have a seller of six 600 bottles of wine, so we're expecting our invitation to dinner sometime soon. But with all that, we know you're going to be perfect with the last question that we ask all of our podcast guests, and that's to provide a wine recommendation to our listeners. And the pressure's on. We're expecting you to wow our listeners and recommend something a little better than Two Buck Chuck. Uh, well, it's, I mean, price matters here. So I will just say that I believe the best wine uh, winery in California is Ridge in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, and the best wine made in California consistently year to year is Ridge Montebello, their signature um, Cabernet blend. Uh, it's not cheap, so anybody's going to run out there and buy a Montebello and look at the price tag and get mad at me for having suggested it. Just know that in advance. The other thing I would say about Montebello is you got to hang on to it for 20 or 25 years before it's really ready to drink. So it's not something you can just take down the, off the shelf and drink it now. I mean, you can, but it's not going to be as best. It really requires a lot of age. Um, another California wine that I like a lot is Chateau Montalina. It's a little bit cheaper, also requires a lot of age. And uh, another one that I can recommend, especially on the Chardonnay side, is um, Mount Eden, also from the, the Santa Cruz Mountains. Those are some go-tos for me from that state. And I like, uh, I'll just mention one more because it's significantly cheaper and usually drinkable, at least the base value, the base variety, that is. They have higher price wines too. But uh, Claude Duval at the southern end of Napa Valley, very Bordeaux-style California cab, so it gets you away from the fruit bomb style, uh, you know, the, the, the jammy, more concentrated wines with the state's been trending in that direction lately, more toward a classic old style. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm consistently a fan of their wines. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks to our guests, Michael Anton, and to my colleague, Tim Anaya. To read more of Michael Anton's work, go to Claremont Review of Books at claremont.org forward slash CRB. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Research one That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.